What's up everybody? Welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video I'm going to do an example of an Epsilon Delta proof using the precise definition of a limit and this proof is going to involve a basic quadratic function. So these are sort of a step up from linear functions as far as difficulty goes. They're a little bit trickier, a little bit more involved. So if you've never done any of these proofs before, definitely go check out the video where I did a example with a linear function. I'll link that above. And if you don't know the definition of the limit or don't really understand it, then I'll link another video where I sort of introduce that definition as well. So let's go and jump right into it using the definition of the limit we start with letting epsilon be greater than zero, right? Because our definition tells us that for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta. So since it's for each epsilon greater than zero, we have to let epsilon be an arbitrary real number greater than zero, but we get to choose delta, right? And delta is dependent on epsilon. So the way I sort of think of it is, you give me an epsilon greater than zero and I can give you a delta and we can keep going back and forth and for any epsilon you give me, I can give you back a delta, right? So this delta is sort of a function of epsilon, but this is where a lot of the work in these proofs comes in because I don't know what to choose for delta until I do some scratch work and figure that out. So we're gonna do that in a second, but I'm gonna continue outlining this proof a little bit because once we have this delta, what we're gonna do next is assume or suppose that that delta expression is true. This is what I call the delta expression. This zero less than absolute value of x minus a or c, whatever letter you use to represent this guy here. So in this case, it's two. We're gonna assume that this is less than delta. And then from here, we're gonna try to show that this assumption leads to the absolute value of f of x. So in this case, that's x squared minus L, in this case that's four, we're gonna show that this assumption leads to this being less than epsilon, right? So that's what we're eventually going to show. We just need to first find this delta that makes this all work out nicely. So typically how we find the delta is we do some scratch work by writing out this F of X minus L expression and manipulating it. And usually what we try to do is represent it somehow but we try to basically make it look like this absolute value of x minus two. That's at least how we did it with the linear function examples. We were able to usually factor and take out a real number and then divide and do all that stuff. It's gonna be a little bit trickier in this case, but just bear with me and you're gonna see how this works. So the first thing I notice if I start messing around with this expression is that this is a difference of squares. So I can factor this as absolute value of x minus two times x plus two. And then what I notice is I have two things being multiplied together inside an absolute value so I can separate them, right? This is the same thing equals, this is the same thing as absolute value of x minus two times the absolute value of x plus two. Okay, so I can separate them. Now I have this absolute value of x plus two expression times something else. So remember, this is what we sort of control the size of. That's the way I think of it at least, this absolute value of x minus two. We're gonna assume that that's less than delta. So based on that assumption, from here, we know that this is less than delta times the absolute value of x plus two. So my first instinct when I was first introduced to these kind of proofs involving quadratic functions was to say, well, we can replace this with delta we want this to be less than epsilon, so let's set this equal to epsilon. This is exactly how we do it with the linear function examples. And then we can just divide out solving for delta. So we get delta equals epsilon over absolute value of x plus two. And there's our choice for delta. But the problem with this is we can't actually do this because delta is a function of epsilon, not a function of x. We can't have an x variable in the delta expression that we choose. So this actually does not work, and this is where sort of the cleverness of this proof comes into play. We can't do that, so I'm actually going to race all the way through here. So this is the clever part, because at this point we make this little assumption. We say, well, let's suppose that delta is less than or equal to one, right? 
And it turns out that you could choose any positive real number here. You could have done two, three, four. We just choose one because it's convenient. It's easy to deal with. And what this allows us to do is eventually put an upper bound, right, to bound this absolute value of x plus 2 expression. And if that doesn't make sense yet, I'll show you how it works right now. If delta is less than or equal to 1, then that means that we have this here, less than or equal to 1, which means that the absolute value of x minus 2 is strictly less than 1, right? So if we bring that out to the side here, Let's see, some scratch work. I'll do it up here, but I'll erase it in a minute. So absolute value of x minus 2, strictly less than 1 based on this assumption. So if I get rid of the absolute value, I can expand it like this. Now I can add 2 to all three parts of the inequality, and I get 1 is less than x is less than 3. Right? So if we make this assumption that delta is less than or equal to 1, then our values of x are bounded above by 3 and below by 1. So how does that affect this absolute value of x plus 2 expression? Well, this absolute value of x plus 2 must be bounded below by 1 plus 2, that's 3, and bounded above by 3 plus 2, that's 5. Right. So since this absolute value of x plus 2 expression is bounded above by 5, we can therefore say that delta times this expression is less than 5 times delta, right? And now we can do what we did with the linear functions, which is say, well, now let's figure out what delta needs to be. We could set this equal to epsilon, solve for delta, so delta equals epsilon over 5. So is this a suitable choice for delta? Can we go back here and write in delta equals epsilon over 5? Well, no, because this choice of delta is based on this assumption that delta is less than or equal to 1. So what we end up doing is choosing the minimum, right? We say delta equals the minimum, and this is the notation for this, min curly brackets 1 epsilon over 5, okay? And what this means is that if epsilon is, let's say, between 0 and 5, then the minimum is epsilon over 5, right? Essentially, what we do is we take the smaller of the two elements inside here. So if epsilon is like 7, then the minimum will be 1. Hopefully that makes sense. And what this implies, and this took me a second to figure out, or to to convince myself of once I was shown this, but this actually implies that, let's see, so, and this is why I left this line blank to write this part out. So, delta is less than or equal to one, and delta is less than or equal to epsilon over five, right? And if you need to think about this for a minute and convince yourself that delta being the minimum of these two elements implies that this is true, then that's fine. It took me a few minutes to convince myself of this as well. But this is really important in finishing this proof. And this is a pretty slick way, I think, to complete this proof. A lot of people will turn this into a proof by cases. You don't really have to do that if you use this fact. And it turns out that this works out nicely because, sure, delta less than or equal to 1 and delta equals epsilon over 5. But remember, if we have a suitable choice for delta, then any delta less than that will work as well, right? So we can actually replace this with less than or equal because once we find a delta that works, any delta less than that will work. This is still based on this assumption, so we need both of these things to be true, which is what choosing this minimum implies, that both of these things hold, right? And it turns out that we're going to need both of these assumptions. So let's finish this proof. Hopefully that makes sense. It took me, honestly... A while of thinking about these kind of proofs to fully make sense of all these ideas so if at the end of this video it still doesn't fully make sense that's pretty normal so now let's see based on this assumption I'll erase this part we're gonna write up the formal proof and I don't think I have to erase everything because the next line is gonna be suppose this I make this assumption my next line is gonna be then and what I'm gonna do now is just consider this f of x minus l expression, right? I'm not assuming anything I shouldn't be. I'm only gonna end up using 
this assumption and these two inequalities, right? So consider this expression. All we're doing is basic algebra, basic algebra. Okay, so from here is where we start using our assumptions. So I'll go back to this step. So because we know that Let's see, which one should we start with? Well, we know that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta. So that's where we can use our delta is less than or equal to, let's see, epsilon over 5. That's where this piece comes into play, right? So if delta is less than or equal to epsilon over 5, then this absolute value of x minus 2 is strictly less than epsilon over 5, right? So that means this expression is less than epsilon over 5 times x plus 2. So that's using this inequality here. Now we're going to use the other inequality. Remember what this inequality implies. It places the bound on this absolute value of x plus 2 expression, right? So from this inequality here, we have that this is less than epsilon over 5 times 5, because remember what this does. It bounds our x above by 3 and below by 1, which means that this is bounded above by 5. So we have epsilon over 5 times 5, which equals epsilon, and that completes the proof. So maybe you want to write it out a little nicer and kind of write out where you're using what assumptions, but hopefully this basic idea makes sense. You can also do a proof by cases. Case one, suppose epsilon is between zero and five, right? Because then your minimum is gonna be epsilon over five. And then case two, suppose, suppose epsilon is greater than or equal to five, then your minimum will be one. You can do that as well. It works out the same way, but I like this. I think it's slick that we use this, these two inequalities, and hopefully y'all enjoyed this as well. It's a little bit tricky, a little bit confusing, may take some time to think about it, but if you have questions, you can let me know in the comments below. Hope you got something out of this video. More videos coming soon. Keep flexing those brain muscles, and I'll see y'all later.